As I mentioned, my name is Jay Young. I'm the facilitator for today's webinar. And I'd like to recognize our, our presidential level uh, corporate sponsor, JLL, and our vice president level uh, partners, Boss of Canon Design, Imagine It Technologies, MOCA, and Trainer HL. You can visit their websites and find out more information about all of them, including Imagine It, or just ask me. Um, Anyway, the, the topic for today's webinar is capital improvement projects, taking control of data. But uh, before we get started, um, I just wanted to let everybody know that uh, please ask questions. We'll answer the questions at the end of the presentation, but there's the chat button um, on, the, on the meeting where uh, please at any time during the call or the, during the webinar, um, put those questions in there, and then we'll get the, to them at the end. Or at the end, uh, you can raise your hand and uh, ask the question at that point, and we'll take care of it. That's about all. So we'll get started. And um, so let me introduce who's going to be on the presenting today. It's uh, We're going to start with Mike Carroll. He's the uh, Senior Project Manager and Licensing Master electrician for FOSS of Canon Design. Over 25 years of uh, cross-market experience supervising and performing electrical assessments, installations, maintenance of major electrical systems, Mike's, Mike naturally bridges the gap uh, between the boots on the ground, client representatives, and FOSS facilities assessment teams. Also, we have uh, Matt Clow, Senior Developer and Programmer for FOSS of Canon Design. Experienced in a variety of software languages uh, and platforms, Matt is adept at working with clients to solve challenges through software application development. Matt's experience is specific to facilities asset management solutions in the markets of higher education, uh, pre-kinder through, through 12, and uh, healthcare, aviation, defense, and more. Dr. Jennifer Lynch is with the Baltimore, well, is the Baltimore County's Director of Educational Partnership. As the Director of Educational Partnership, Dr. Jennifer Lynch serves as a bridge between Baltimore County government and the Baltimore County school system, providing guidance and recommendations to the county's executives on school-related issues. She has over 20 years experience as an executive leader in both public and private sectors. And uh, the last person in our uh, group of presenters today is Paul Mills. Paul is the Senior Vice President of uh, K through 12 Strategy with Canon Design. Paul is Canon Design's National Pre-K through 12 Strategist with 24 years of AEC uh, industry experience delivering professional services for educational clients nationwide, including strategic capital planning, stakeholder engagement and data-driven decision support, facility condition and functional adequacy assessment, uh, funding acquisition, and program management for design and construction. So with that, I'd like to turn it over and uh, let the webinar start. You've got it. Thanks for those introductions, Jay. I really wish it were only 24 years of experience. I think we have an old bio there. <laughs> but uh, before we get into our program, just a little bit about our, our organization. Um, FOSS of Canon Design is a specialty service area that um, does a broad range of asset management, facilities management type functions, including um, the sorts of work that Canon Design delivered with Baltimore County Schools. We have a lot of industry accolades and one thing we're really proud of is our research and development. We don't just um, talk about it, we do it. And we live it in, in how we do research and development. Um, data is really central to this presentation. And we do all sorts of dashboarding and modeling with data to help inform smart decisions. What you have on screen here was one of my pet projects during the, the coronavirus um, in partnership with ASHRAE. We developed a, a risk dashboard to put configurations uh, for classroom type spaces, or you can use it for any space. 
in terms of dimensions of rooms and different attributes about airflow, um, type of filtration, and um, the number of people and time of exposure, et cetera, to convey the sorts of risk. Now, we've learned a lot since the initial days of the pandemic, but we're really proud to have leveraged all of our expertise in the physical environments, as well as data science, um, to bring an accessible platform to stakeholders around the country. Paul, I'm not sure if you're sharing your screen yet. Oh, mama, here we go. Thank you. Soon share, oh, bingo. Fantastic. So enough about us. We really want to take a moment and get a feel for who's with us today. So we'd like to hear from you and we're going to use a live polling tool. Dara has posted into the chat a link that's down here on the bottom, this menti.com. It's for Mentimeter. It's a tool we use a lot for um, stakeholder engagements and to um, support meaningful dialogue. Um, also, if you want, and it's a lot easier, just pull out the old trusty camera on your phone, point your camera at that QR code, and it'll probably prompt you to click on it and um, it'll launch your browser. So I'll give you another 10 seconds or so to try to either open up another browser window or get your camera on it, but we'll have a little bit of fun. Cool, I'm seeing some clicks on there. Sounds like um, some of you guys are getting logged in. This is neat. Um, when we talk about data and we think about hard data a lot in terms of you know, the square feet of facilities that we're talking about, the different systems and what condition they're in, or even the functional adequacy and how we can objectively measure things to um, how it supports your mission as an institution. We also like to think of other aspects, the human side, the soft data, if you will, as an important aspect. And as we tell the story about the Baltimore County experience, um, you'll see a lot of that. We're gonna give you an example of it. Here again, if you missed out on the opportunity, I throw the QR on your screen. But as I hit advance, it's going to actually take control of your browser and put a question that we can all answer. And you'll see all the responses live on screen as part of it. One little thing that happens, it's Mentimeter is set up to not be rude. So if you're in the middle of answering a question and I advance to the next question, it will allow you to finish instead of just advancing on, but it'll put a little banner at the top. So if you find yourself a little bit lost in it, it's quite likely you've got this little banner at the top. So just click the go to slide and you'll get present with everyone else. Does that make sense? Cool. So a couple of softball questions just to get us started here. We wanna get a feel for our audience so that we can target our conversation um, in ways that make sense to you. So as you can see, every time someone votes on your phone or browser, we get a little you know, graphic indication. What I love about Minimeter is it's kind of whimsical and organic the way it bounces around and stuff, but quickly visually we can start to see things. So we have one lone person um, out in Pacific time zone. We have four folks in mountain, 10 in central, 11 we're growing. Um, and a few people in Eastern time zone as well, but predominantly it seems that we're um, overwhelmed with folks in central area. So it's interesting. We can think climatologically and stuff as we go through it. Um, so cool. We have 23 folks that were able to vote in. And what's neat about the tool is we can actually cross tabulate answers from one question into another and help display that graphically as well. So having a little bit of fun here, tis the season, right? So we want people to vote on what your, the best Thanksgiving dessert is. And again, if you're stuck on the previous question, there might be a little banner and just click, go to slide and it'll bring you up to where we are. All right, we're approaching the same number of folks that voted last time. And um, so again, we have kind of a data visualization that's appearing before our eyes. And this is a trivial one, obviously, but it's one that to show an example of the way we can kind of use this, and we will use it in more meaningful ways in just a moment. But it looks like pumpkin pie is the favorite dessert out of it. We internally did one, and unfortunately, I, I hate to say that something I can drink might have been uh, towards the top, let's just say. <laughs> What's also neat, too, as I mentioned, uh, we do cross-tabulate the um, 
responses to the previous question, what time zone you're in, and you can see how it breaks down within each area. So what I can predominantly say here is that things are jumping off the page. You know, we've got um, half the folks that prefer something to drink for dessert come from the east. So you guys duly noted. Cool. We're going to ask a few more questions here, and this is for us to get to know you a little bit before we jump in and, and get into presentation sort of mode as part of it. Um, and we ask this, you know, to be as respectful of your time so we can target our efforts for you. This is for you, and we appreciate the privilege to be able to speak with you today. So the first one, here's a type of question where you just type in an answer. And again, if you're stuck on the whole thing, there might be a banner and just click the button at the top and get you there. And it's wonderful if you can just kind of type in what you think. And every time someone hits submit, we get to see some of the responses. Part of it, and this helps everyone in the room kind of see um, who's involved. So I see folks from private industry or private universities. I see folks from state institutions, um, from local governments, from private industry. So we have quite a diversity of perspectives. DCAM Massachusetts, great to see you guys. Um, great. So anyway, it's kind of a fun, whimsical way we can use to engage folks. If, you know, these are tools that you could leverage into your work as well. But it's a way we can start to make these engagements fun, interesting, we can do it live, whether we're in person together or even virtually, just like we're doing now as part of it. So I'm gonna kick it to the next screen and if it interrupted you, you're probably gonna have to hit the little button at the top banner there. But um, we wanna get a feel for what your roles are so that we can target our conversation around that as well. So we asked if you know primary focus is more on the O&M side or big on you know capital projects, are you really exclusively involved in the planning? elements or is it really kind of you all of the above works for you or perhaps there's another category and every time someone clicks you can see it bounce a little bit and the, the register comes up live right before our eyes so we're seeing here is that there's really a broad base of folks that have all of the above plus maybe a bias a little bit more towards major capital projects as opposed to the day-to-day -day operations and maintenance a handful of folks in long range planning as well as in other and we'll use this information to kind of steer our messaging and how we you know how, how we go through our presentations to you cool a few more um we'll get out of this mode of the presentation here in just a second but just curious why folks are here today All right, so a little bit of humor in here. We, we put in the old, I was voluntold to be here. No responses there so far. For it sounds like, you know, in the spirit of professional development, this is what we expected to see um, as part of the exercise today. Here's another one. This is a word cloud graphic. And as you start to enter a few words, but here's the prompt, just your biggest challenges in your role you know, professionally around facilities management, the sort of work that you do and your responsibilities, a few words that might describe what those biggest challenges, hurdles, obstacles might be in uh, achieving success in your role. So each time someone hits submit, we get to see the words and they start to dance around. And this is not just a brainstorm and a series of words. It actually is an infographic of sorts. The more frequently a word shows up, it becomes bigger and bolder as part of it. So right now we can already tell with five votes in that budget, it seems to be one of the more predominantly more frequently done, followed by staffing, funding related to budget, et cetera. But as you can see, it's it's a really interesting how this thing evolves quickly over time once we have more and more folks in there. Again, another means to actually collect a little bit of soft data, um, but also in a way we can do it in engaging and, and do some conversations around it. One thing I'm really pleased when I use this sort of tool is, is we might have a room and we're trying to dis make, you know, facilitate a really important decision. And I don't know if anyone has seen the movie or 
read or seen the play of um, uh, 12 Angry Men that's out there. The movie had Henry Fonda as part of it, but the, the premise was it was a jury that was deciding the fate of someone who was accused of, of uh, murder. And the one sole you know, juror, Henry Fonda, had the opportunity to kind of say, well, hang on a second here, and went, went through a dialogue and little by little, the conversation turned as part of it. Well, using these kinds of tools, we can actually find that silent majority in the room. And whereas you might feel like everyone is in alignment on a very important decision, you might have someone that votes in opposition. And if you can prompt them, say, hey, would you share your perspective as part of it? We've learned through this process that we can have those 12 angry men type approaches where maybe the whole decision isn't changed, but a lot of new perspective is brought to it and um, nuance and caveats. So these sorts of technologies are a lot of fun to do and they make your engagements with your stakeholders more interesting and engaging, but also at the same time, it does collect some interesting data as part of it. So you guys can see here, feel free to screenshot and there'll be in the videos as well, but you can kind of see, you know, the perspectives in the room, budget and funding kind of one and two as part of it. staffing, money and people, that's what I'm hearing, supply chain, communication, and other, you know, kind of human element, approval process, a lot of stuff that's out there. And I know that in our, you know, we had plan on touching on many of these topics as we go through the conversation and we'll make sure to highlight several of these. All right, I think I have one or two more as part of it. And this is a way to um, kind of ask several questions in one time. And it's kind of a scale type thing. It's five points along a spectrum of weakness versus strength. And you know, if you wanted to submit one on any particular category, like the very first one, preventative maintenance versus reactive maintenance. Is this is something your organization really has a strong handle on, has a very strong preventative maintenance program, you'd probably put a number five on it. If your organization is really on the complete opposite end and you're putting out fires all the time and only doing that, then maybe you'd put a one. But if you're somewhere in between, likewise, you do the same. So we have several attributes about kind of the roles of a facilities operation that we put forward here. And we do this in a way, just kind of do a quick poll and see where folks in this, within our small sample size might sit. One thing I'll also point out is what it does is it computes just a mathematical average of all the different votes that everyone submits. So you'll see on the first one here, the average is 2.8. Um, and going down the way, the highest one seems to be quality and customer satisfaction tracking as part of your metrics. Really awesome that um, you're taking you know, your stakeholders voice and your mission to support them in such a positive way. That's awesome to see. But in addition to just the averages, you can see also kind of the spread, right? You could have a case where you're right in the middle and all the votes are right in the middle, or you could have a case where the votes are polarized. Do you see the little shadow that's behind shows the relative distribution of the votes as part of it, which can also help inform conversations um, as part of it. Again, another way to take something that can be somewhat subjective and hard to measure and using some sort of sampling and polling or um, even large broad-based surveys, you can bring something that feels subjective and make it a little bit more objective as part of using this sort of metrics as part of it. So interesting, I'm just kind of looking at some of the responses here, our lowest kind of weakness, if you will, closest to weakness for folks is the use of information technology um, as part of it. Strength is just like I mentioned before and observed at the final conclusion here, quality and customer satisfaction tracking seems to be in the highest spot. Cool, and that actually tees up, the use of information technology tees up one more question that we've got here. And if you're still answering, just go ahead and hit the little, go to the right slide button at the top of your browser. What best describes the tools your organization uses for facility management? So we kind of put a spectrum here, everything from off the shelf bought software packages to maybe something developed in house where they use a lot of spreadsheets like most organizations do. If this is, you know, really we write stuff down, we have a big board and use dry erase markers on it. Or maybe guess what guys, we have a lot of great people and it's just all in their heads. So as you're answering here, we did cross tabulate um, the answer from a previous question based on what your primary role was and focus, whether it was operations and maintenance related, 
major capital projects related, planning related, or all the above. And um, kind of interesting to see here, not surprising in any regard, but if you're to look at the major capital projects um, as kind of a group, tends to be towards third-party software, in-house applications, and spreadsheets, but really biased towards actually having a formal software package, not surprising. Implementing a big expensive project, you wanna make those investments to make sure those projects are under control. On operation maintenance, um, we only had one vote there, so sample size is really small, but happy to see third-party software as a component of it. But again, this is just another way we can kind of do some sorts of measures. And as it was stated, there were some challenges related to our, you know, relative weakness in terms of technology versus some of those other categories of things, something to be mindful of. And perhaps the folks that are in living in the world of spreadsheets, there are solutions out there, perhaps, that um, you know, folks like Foss of Canon Design or other providers could, um, could help you with. I've got one more. And this really gets into the, the space of where your mission and your leadership, um, whether they're elected officials or executive officials in your organizations, this question seems to be ever present now. It always was, but I think the pandemic really brought to light and also other circumstances in society have brought a new you know, renewed focus on equity and driving, understanding what that means and how might the organization support it. So the question is kind of a two pronged question. How important is it within your organization in terms of emphasis? So is it a high priority or a low priority? And then how well equipped is your organization to actually respond to those requests as part of it? You know, we need help or we've got it solved sort of spectrum. So as you can see here on screen, we've got one average that's in the middle and then all the different votes are the little dots that are connected to it with the lines as part of it. So it's kind of a quadrant sort of thing, trying to get a feel for, you know, with our small sample size here, for in this issue of equity, is this being considered a high priority or low priority? And also how well, how strong, it's very interesting. All the dots seem to show up either in, it's a high priority and we've got a good handle on it, or it's a low priority and, you know, we could possibly use some help, but maybe not so much because it's um, a case where it's not really being driven by the organization. You know, but you see the, all the spectrums as part of it. We don't see any dots here in it's a huge priority and we need some help. And we don't see the case either where we've got all the answers, but no one's asking about it. It's kind of an interesting spread. And what's neat is with this type of question in Mentimeter, you can actually list several items and you can see all of them and then hover one by one through and see the spread. But you can do a cross compare, let's say equity versus response or quality or other aspects of your operation could be seen on the same spectrum simultaneously. Again, another way to use soft data, we limited it to one because we wanted to focus on this area of equity, which really is central to the Baltimore County um, experience that we had together. Cool, that's our last question. And we've got 46 folks in the room or whatever. I don't know if there's any questions that are posted in chat or anything there. We'd love to hear any responses or thoughts as we step into more of our presentation mode of, of this interaction. Don't see any questions in chat. No, no questions. All right. Great. You can raise your hand if anyone has a question. If not, let's continue. Or comments. Great. Fantastic. Well, anyway, this has been helpful for us to understand kind of our the perspectives of our audience today, and we'll keep those things in mind. As we go through the presentation, please do use the chat or raise your hand as part of it. We'll be monitoring those as we go. And um, uh, appreciate everyone's participation in our little exercise and look forward to um, having a little bit more storytelling of some of the successes we've had. Okay, excellent. All right, so you can see we're doing a little bit of wayfinding to keep us through here. We're stepping up to number two.
in our exercise, and I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Jennifer Lynch. Thank you, Paul. I appreciate it. And thank you so much for having me here with you today. Um, I really enjoy the opportunity to talk about all things capital planning and especially the work that Baltimore County government and Baltimore County public schools has done with Canon design because I, it is an incredibly transformative process that we engaged in over the course of about two years. Um, and it is like something that we've never really seen before in, in the state of Maryland. It's something I have never experienced in my um, in my experiences either in the education side of the house or in, or in government. So um, it is a really solid process, and we've been really thrilled um, with the outcome and the results. But just to give you a little bit of um, table setting, Baltimore County Public Schools surrounds Baltimore City. So Baltimore County is one of those unique counties across the, the United States in which the city is not incorporated into the county. So we are separate from Baltimore City, but we sort of horseshoe around the city. It's very large going all the way up to the Pennsylvania border um, and then down to the Chesapeake Bay. It's about 682 square miles of ba Baltimore County. It's very large. We always like to say that in Baltimore County, we are larger than the state of Rhode Island in terms of population. We have about, uh, we have, you know, over, well over 800,000 residents in Baltimore County. Baltimore County Public Schools it has about 111,000 students. It's the 24th largest district in the state, in the United States, and third in Maryland. So it is a very large school system. We have 176 um, school centers and programs. Um, mostly those are schools. We do have, a, um, you know, just a few sort of unique situations that are programs. Um, we have though, out of that 176 schools, we have the third um, oldest facility portfolio in the state of Maryland, as well as the third largest. So we have um, really coming in just behind Baltimore City Public Schools and then Prince George's Public Schools, the sort of the largest bank of schools, and they are all fairly old. Most are over 50 years old at this point in time. We also continue to grow as, as a county. So we have, um, we are sort of busting at the seams and we have facilities that are, are all dating at roughly the same amount, at the same rate. So we have sort of a, a large portfolio that needs um, some level of almost immediate attention because they were all built in, in, similar, in a similar era. Um, we have 18 million square feet of facilities. So we have, a, you know, a, a large portfolio to maintain. Um, but one of the important things to notice about that goes just above and beyond what our portfolio portfolio um, looks like is really the demographics of our district. So our district is unique in that we have it all. We have urban areas, suburban areas, ex-urban areas. Um, we have um, really high poverty, concentration of poverty areas, as well as very high wealth areas. Um, we are an incredibly di diverse um, county and an even more diverse school system. We are actually a majority minority um, county at this point in time, and, and our schools um, you know, certainly follow suit in that as well. As you can see, we our school system is 32.8% white students, um, and then we sort of have a, a mixture of um, other non-white populations, including our African-American population is our largest population at this point. However, um, we are seeing a large surge in our Hispanic um, population. And then we are also starting to see a lot of shifts in immigration that are changing some of those other um, rates of representation as well. So we are becoming much more diverse in a very short amount of time. Um, and that becomes important for a lot of different reasons. Um, we have buildings that are not set up to manage the educational needs of the students that are coming to school. They're not, they are not set up for things like small group instruction, English language learner programs, special education programs. They are all in all um, just not equipped for modern learning environments. Some of the older buildings won't even maintain Wi-Fi service. Um, they don't maintain the current class sizes that we need or really looking to the future. What are we doing around career and tech technical education? What are we doing to expand pre-K? Um, 
So we sort of have buildings that are not meeting the current learning needs. Um, and then we also have uh, um, a large amount of inequity around, we had, and we are working on, on it, I should say, a large amount of inequity around which of these buildings in our system were having attention paid to them. And that was largely happening um, around advocacy, advocacy in the community. So our um, communities that were able to advocate to our school board to have their schools reach the top priority, that those who were able to have the governor come take a walk through the school or the county executive were often bumped up in the list and were given um, larger amounts of um, capital investment than some of our, our, of our needier communities. Um, so, you know, we sort of have all of that happening at the same time that in the state of Maryland, we have just, our uh, General Assembly has just enacted what we call the Blueprint for Maryland's Future. And that is this huge comprehensive education bill that is focused on the actual instruction components and the teaching components. But what is often missed is how that will impact our school facilities. And, and one of the real, glaring omissions in this very large bill is the capital investments that will support it. So um, it talks about really expanding um, pre-K, universal pre-K for three and four year olds living in poverty. Um, and that in just Baltimore County alone, we would need to service about 8,000 students. And where do you put 8,000 new students who need very specific pre-K classrooms in order to have their learning? There's also expansions of career and technology education um, programs and where are the, those being housed, as well as expanding community schools that include things like food pantries and, um, and other community spaces, health suites that would serve the whole entire community. So this, this very large bill has put this additional sort of pressure on capital, on capital space without the investment to do it. So um, we sort of had this, you know, kind of a mess for lack of better term of we had 176 schools, we were kind of trucking through as state funding would become available. We would take a look at what was coming up, what advocacy had been happening. And we were just sort of in these very short sighted stints you know, making the making these investments. And, you know, we are really lucky that the county executive, current county executive in Baltimore County has a real eye for equity. And so he started to ask the hard questions of what are we doing if communities do not have the ability to advocate for their communities? What are we doing to make sure that we are using an equitable approach to thinking about not just these four or five schools that we can now address in this current CIP cycle, but how are we starting to draft a plan so that every family in this county can look and say, well, we know when our students are gonna have an investment in their school and what that level of investment looks like. And we have a way to make sure that we can answer the hard questions. Um, I think when Paul started and we were talking about like, where is your focus on equity? Um, part of the hard conversation around equity is when you are shifting resources from communities that are used to having high advocacy and then high results um, to communities that have had low advocacy and low results, is that there's a real push-pull in the community of, of a concern of having resources taken away from, from them. And so we needed to have a way that we could anchor those decisions and we could anchor those conversations with our communities about what is best for students. And there have been multiple studies that have been done over the years in Baltimore County. There are studies that are done at our state level that show just what that facility condition is. But what we were finding is that just looking at facility condition wasn't actually answering all of the questions that we needed because we had some that had great facility conditions, but were extremely overcrowded. And we had students who were learning, we had 12, 15, maybe 18 trailers on a school property. Um, or we had, the facility was great, but it was just not set up in a manner that is conducive to the way that we learn now, either through by having open school settings or something else. So in, um, you know, in a collaborative effort, Baltimore County Public Schools and Baltimore County government commission can and design together in this long range planning process to assess every single building, those 176 buildings that I told you about to begin with, 
according to three in three sort of different assessment categories, three different pillars. So we looked at our facility condition, our educational equity, and then our capacity. And one of the great, I just wanna sort of pause for a minute because I think one of the, the wonderful things that happen in our work with Paul's team is that our community then started to identify what was a priority for them. And so what came out of this process was that our community started to say, out of all of these three, we really wanna make sure that every single student has a seat in a building. And so that helped us then start to determine where some of our priorities were go going to lie. I'm gonna let, I know Paul is gonna go pretty into in depth in, in the whole process. But this process was intensive. It was over two years. We had a system by which we surveyed over 20, 25,000 um, residents in Baltimore County. We had multiple stakeholder groups, focus groups. Um, we had full day sessions in which we looked at entire cohorts of, of um, buildings and asked hard questions of our community members. So this whole process was co-constructed, founded in data, but co-constructed with our community to say, here are all of our options. What, you know, what are we going to do together? And having that buy-in from our community has really helped us then anchor into this document as a long range plan because we've, we've decided on it as a community together. And so instead of every year that we have a CIP cycle, there's a new set of advocacy, there's a new set of voices. We, everybody in the community sort of knows that this is the direction that we're going and this is what we can expect. And it doesn't mean that it's not iterative in nature, but it means that we all have a common understanding of how we are starting to think both short-term and long-term in our capital planning. Um, and I think the most important thing that we really did that we continue to do is to anchor every single decision in that of equity. So we really made sure that all of our decisions, if we didn't have um, you know, voices from a particular group, we went out and found them. Um, you know, we did our due diligence to make sure that every single community, every single perspective was at the table as we were constructing this plan. <laughs> And then I guess I'll, I will, I've sort of talked a lot, but I'm gonna pause and see if there's any questions or Paul, if there's anything that you think that I have not touched on that I should take a minute. Uh, you nailed it. Um, in the interest of time, we're gonna move forward and um, again, use the chat or raise your hand for any particular questions and we're gonna turn over the mic. Who might be on mute. Yeah, I'm off now. So, um, yeah, I'm Mike Carroll. I'm a senior project manager here at Fossil Canon Design. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, our process in general and then talk about um, the process that we used with Baltimore County Schools um, a little more specifically here. Um, so at Fossil Canon Design, we, we have a facility condition assessment and our approach is um, our professional um, team of licensed architects and engineers, constructors, uh, facility managers, cost estimators, and, and system specialists perform uh, observational field assessments of selected assets and use this collected information to answer the following questions. Um, what is the condition of, the, of each asset? Uh, what are the values and liabilities of each asset? What is the equipment life cycle for the assessed systems? Uh, what it would cost to maintain each system over its life cycle? What should be the annual budget to achieve the appropriate level of improvement? Um, how should capital improvement plan be pri prioritized based on the available funding? And also, how can operating costs be stabilized and or reduced? Um, so we take all that information and we 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 also use the information provided by you know the client. We review the maintenance re and um, repair records, uh, building plans, cost studies or surveys, and any other available documentation that they may have. Uh, we interview key, key personnel to to prepare and understand the current issues, conduct a detailed field study uh, and survey, 
um, document the deficiencies, kind of what this is talking about here, we walk, talk, and document. So as you can see by this slide that our, our typical day is 15,000 to 20,000 steps, some more than that. Uh, we've covered, for Baltimore County, we were covering approximately 1.4 million square feet in a week. So we were blowing and going through through uh, Baltimore County because they had, uh, and as they talk, as Jennifer talked about, they have a very large school district, um, variety of buildings. We talk amongst ourselves. We talk amongst the the people that are there at the facility, uh, and then we document that we use we use iPhones. We use uh, we take photos. Uh, hundreds and hundreds and thousands of photos that we use. Uh, we build a we we build a picture as we're walking through here, or or build a story with the photos uh, as we document that. Um, the so something to keep in mind that this is just a visual operation. I mean, our observation. We we do not go into equipment. There's some things that we can. There's some things we don't. So the information that we get back from the client from Baltimore County or anybody that we're we're working with for that matter is invaluable because we're just going there, you know, for a day or a partial day or whatever it may be, and you have people that are there every day. You know, they understand their systems, they understand their components, they understand where their shortcomings are. Um, so as we as we collect this information, we have a proprietary software that we use and, and what we do is we write records. So a record is a is a description of of what the component may be or what the system may be. Um, it it tell it gives a brief description of what it is, the critical issues that we found or we have been told about, and also the recommendation that we have to bring the, the system back to current replacement value. And something to keep in mind is what we assess what's there. So if there's if there's something that's not there, we we obviously can't assess it, but but we can also write that into the report saying, you know. The, the client mentioned that we don't have this, say a security system or or cameras or whatever it may be. And, you know, depending where in the country, where what part of the country in, you may not have HVAC in a building anymore. So even though it's not there, we can enter information into our into our records that generate into the reports that will give you that information. So as far as as far as Baltimore County goes, we decided um, what well, Paul's team decided that uh, we need to do like a two, a level two, level three uh, assessment on this. So it's major systems and and secondary systems. So it, as part of the master planning, Paul and his team use our information along with the information they gathered for educational sustainability, which Matt and Paul will talk about shortly, to to build a story around what they need. So as you can see from this from this chart here, that you know a level one is is very high level. I, I like to call it two three. It's like a thirty thousand foot overview of, of what it looks like. You're basically just coming up with a dollar figure of bring that that system component or building back to current replacement value. Now, as you go up, as you slide up the scale, it gets more granular. You get more information all the way up to a level five. It takes longer to, to do a, a more comprehensive FCA. And in turn, it, 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 it's gonna cost more too. And But like all the way up to a level five, we also do asset tagging. So we attach an asset tag that has a barcode, has a QRC code on it. Um, and, and if you use this in conjunction with say a CMMS, uh, the technician can be out in the field um, hover over the QR code, and it'll take you automatically to the asset tag records, which, which explains all the information that we've gathered off the asset tag. And it is also li a link to the record inside the system. So it, it's a living document. You can use this, like I said, in conjunction with CMMS to, as you upgrade uh, 
equipment, as you repair equipment. It could be in, in very poor condition, and a couple years from now, you do that and you take that up. Um, so, it, and again, for Baltimore County, we took a very high level. Uh, we moved through their facilities very quickly. And, and once we had a few buildings done, we, we, we um, had them participate in a pilot program, which we took some buildings, say, here's what, here's what we've come up with based on what you guys were looking for. And when we first looked at it, uh, the, the school district decided, well, you know, this works good, but we need a little bit more better detail. So we went back and we looked at that and said, okay, we can provide that. You know, they, they didn't want, they didn't want too much detail, you know, to, to move their eyes away from the, the, the goal, but they need a little bit more. So we kind of, we kind of built this around what suited them best and also what suited Paul and his team uh, to be able to use best. Thanks, Mike. Uh, we can pass it on to Matt to talk about our functional adequacy assessment as related to the schools. Yep. Thanks, Mike. Um, so I, I really want to discuss our approach to the multi-year improvement plan and uh, really dive into what we call the uh, the three pillar facility study here. Um, overall, this really allowed us to um, assess the district through multiple multiple lenses um, and not just through that standard facility condition standpoint, but uh, really taking it uh, much more in depth. Um, and, and by introducing this educational adequacy and, and equity portion along with the uh, capacity and utilization of each campus district wide, um, it allowed us to really um, equitably provide a plan uh, for a fully comprehensive pathway uh, for the district to follow. Um, believe it or not, we, we collected over 100,000 data points within these three categories um, and rolled out and established a countywide survey uh, that really allowed the stakeholders, uh, the principals, the community members to, to really voice their experiences and, and the objectives that they would like to see happen within the, uh, the district. Um, the majority of the data, you know, it yielded many objective measures, but we also needed, you know, what I call the soft data, which is somewhat object, uh, subjective, but um, it, it's kind of the feelings and the attitude, uh, attitudes kind of towards the, the educational program as a whole and the operations um, of the district. Um, and what this does, it, it really helps us tremendously by determining um, what those equity gaps are and um, identifying those access to resources for all students. Um, of course, you know, data consistency is always at the forefront of what we do. Uh, without consistent data, it, it's very difficult to compare facilities um, and develop benchmarking results that uh, are truly actionable for the district to make decisions upon. Um, but since we do have that consistent data and, and able to normalize it, um, essentially we're able to develop uh, what we kind of developed as a, as a combined measured score, which kind of took um, the aggregate of, of all these three pillars and, and, der and derived a, a ranking and prioritization uh, across the district. So what you're kind of seeing here on the left-hand side is a little snapshot of a report that we put together that kind of helps us rank and, and rack and stack the, the different campuses across the district. And uh, really the overall goal here in the study was um, to help inform an objective sequencing uh, strategy for uh, the district's capital improvement plan. So it's, you know, it's not just formulaic where we uh, develop an algorithm and, and allow the data to make decisions for us. Uh, there's much need for human intervention um, and analysis that takes place in order to, to really help prioritize the needs and determine a complex scheduling um, so in general, you know, the, the decisions uh, usually followed a, you know, the greater the need, the higher priority perspective, but um, you also have to con consider the things that I've, I've listed here, such as um, some of the educational initiatives and the readiness of, of each campus, um, land availability, you know, understanding uh, the constraints um, within these urban areas, um, funding and cash flow. This was one of the, the big things on the survey earlier. You know, it's probably the number one hurdle that most organizations face 
Um, there's never enough money to, to do everything on the wish list. Um, and with that comes the responsibility of, of analyzing uh, the cost efficiencies of the things that are being implemented. Uh, last one here, uh, strategic exceptions, right? Um, so an example of, of perhaps one specific region or campus is, is just growing exponentially in their enrollment. So in addition at that school would make more sense to kind of move that up on the priority chain uh, to account for more capacity uh, for the next school year. Um, but overall, you know, the, this, uh, what this in-depth analysis really provides is, is for the district to have a clear understanding of how to be intentional uh, about how they allocate uh, allowances and budget um, and accounting for uh, dynamics in, in the, the enrollment that's growing, the mission of the educational programs, and, and of course, um, the evolving state mandates that the uh, district must adhere to. Hey, Matt, I'm going to jump us ahead here in the interest of time. Yeah, no problem, Paul. Go ahead, man. Great. So um, Matt was describing, and we have this functional adequacy assessment, that this is very educational in nature. However, in your roles in um, managing portfolios for state institutions, local governments, even private industry or higher education agencies, a similar sort of metric could be done. So think in terms of maybe less about the specifics, but more about the general framework and how it could add value, perhaps to your organization. Uh, it's basically a big weighted rubric, right? So we have six different categories that we designed with um, Baltimore County Public Schools, as well as a bunch of KPI subcategories beneath those that were all objectively measured using data at the heart of it. Um, you know, here's you know, the data visualization on a dashboard where where you could pull down the, the lever. This was for Catonsville Middle School. You could see where its aggregate score stacks up zero to 100 point scale versus all the other schools in the county. And then you could see how the breakdown of the different categories. So you can see a visual way where stuff can be benchmarked and helps understand what those issues are. Drilling down, you can go even within a category and go to all the different KPIs as part of it seeing all the different scores that relate to it. In this example here, operation and utility was an important aspect of the work. And this particular school ranked really high on accessibility, but it's operational efficiency and energy efficiency and different data-driven measures put it down towards the bottom. These sorts of things really helped when we're sorting out what the sorts of solutions would be. We spoke a lot about equity and we've, as an industry, evolved quite a bit and I must say, I, I had the privilege of learning a lot from uh, Dr. Lynch and her organization at Baltimore County Public Schools, really around the notion of what the graphic is displaying here. You know, if you can imagine three folks of different heights that want to see over a wall, that in the interest of equity, we can say, okay, everyone gets a, a footstool, something they can stand on to see over it. However, it might work great for some, marginally for others, and maybe not at all for some. As an industry, when we've assessed facilities, we've used a common yardstick, an ed spec or a standard and said, you know what? We can treat all the brick and mortar like for like and make it equal. That really gets into that left-hand side of equality. However, what we've learned from working with Baltimore County Public Schools has really elevated that conversation. It's not just about the brick and mortar, but it's about the flesh and blood. It's about the human beings that are being served by these, or these facilities. So we looked at not just a minimum standard that applies everywhere, but also a flexible additional standard that may be conditional on the different communities of service there. For instance, um, in areas where we have high preponderance of English learners or that we sadly have uh, homeless students that are attending the schools and other socioeconomic indicators that would drive some need for the services provided that might not exist everywhere. By doing this, we're able to really heighten the, the bar on it and it provide those sorts of supports flexibly in a way that actually achieved equity. Here's another example from a different client where we were able to benchmark looking at the students that attended the facilities and compared by different racial groups. Um, the average age, the average condition of facilities in a way that gets into the sort of space we're talking about earlier, where organizations are trying to come to grips with what it means and how we can objectively measure it and maybe take steps towards closing those gaps. We also did mapping of access, equitable access to services. Um, and in this case, it was career tech programs. 
So in all the different areas, these are the different high schools that offer different pathways of career tech education. In this case here highlighted um, in the construction and development pathways. We can also filter by a certain pathway and see where it sits on the map. In this example here, we've, we've noticed that the health sciences and biosciences um, career paths all existed on the west-hand side of the county and really opened up the eyes to leadership about how we might be able to make a more equitable allocation of these programs and make accessibility there for students that might exist, um, that live on the east side. A couple little points here about our commitment to data quality. We use the data itself as a way to look for outliers, to do inner rater comparisons so that it's not just a, guess what, here's our data, trust us, it's good. We actually hold ourselves to a high standard, make sure that we compare the data as it's rolling in and see if we have an outlier case like in this example here, where team three's results on the architecture, the age of the building versus the condition index of those uh, architectural systems tended to have a different trend curve as part of it. We noticed that and we're able to make some corrections and see where cases were driven, not just by outlier data, but rather by just judgment calls and business rules. That's what we like to do as part of it. Peer benchmarking is an important aspect of what we do. This is an example where we could look at every single county across Maryland and see the size of high schools across the way. As Baltimore County had a tradition of having somewhat smaller high schools, the conversation of a few of them, as you can see, butting up over the state average started to trigger some conversation. Do we continue to add additions and grow or do we look at a new high school to relieve these schools? Um, using data in this way in a graphic way can help people really center on um, the issues. So bringing in all the life, we use all this data in composite. Matt mentioned the three pillar study that we did and we had all these dashboards put together so we could look at collections of schools and come up with a series of options. One thing that's cardinal to the way we like to present it isn't just develop a plan and roll it out and say, folks, here's the plan, what do you think? It's more about, please come to us and share your perspectives on it. How do you support it? So as you can see, we actually use survey information to measure the different options that were presented and see not just overall, but also those directly affected or not affected by certain outcomes. And by comparing these, we're able to come up with solutions that were consistent with what the priorities of the community were. Jumping ahead here, um, as part of this process, we learned at Baltimore County that the, the needs far outweighed the budget. So if you look at the gray band around kind of our, our donut chart here, you know, 4.7 billion of needs. And as we discovered later to really fulfill the expectations universally, it could be multiples of that but the budget over a 15 year period was just a fraction of that, which was a real challenge. So we had to go through and really you know, be consistent and be equitable in terms of what kind of recommendations were put forward. And at the end of the day, the multi-year improvement plan for all schools lived up to its title, that it was a plan that was achievable and equitable across the county. And we could validate that with one sole exception with a lot of um, some of the, the politics and um, advocacy expectations that were out there that Dr. Lynch was referring to, that almost universally, this plan was in alignment with what was measured with the voices of over 25,000 stakeholder um, you know, surveys that were conducted. With that, I think we've reached the top of our time, but I wanted to open up for any other questions that might come out of it. We've really enjoyed our time with you. There is one question, Paul, um, and I'll read it. Um, it used to be stated that 75% of the building's costs were in operations. Has, uh, has the cost of construction reduced or has the cost of operations increased um, with the number and the age of the older buildings? That's a great question. So I think we had it in uh, Mike's section, we had, I forget what the figure was, did we say 80%? I'm not sure what the source of that response is, Mike. You might want to um, weigh in there, maybe Dara or, my, or uh, Matt, uh, as part of it. There's a lot of benchmarks out there that kind of measure as far as asset management, you know, initial one-time costs versus the overall cost of ownership over the life of an asset, and those sorts of benchmarks. You know, 75% versus 80. We're kind of all in the same sort of range. Um, 
and cardinally as part of it. But um, that is a great question. I'd love for others that are a little more centered on that to maybe weigh in, or even other panelists that, um, you know, others that are attending that might want to weigh in on the conversation. I don't hear any volunteers. <laughs> I know we're at top of the hour and uh, yeah. maybe we, we used a bit of time on our little interactive exercise at the beginning, but uh, okay. I hope everyone appreciated it. Well, maybe we should wrap things up. And um, again, thank. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, you for presenting and all the presenters, as well as everyone for participating in the webinar today. I hope it was informative for any for everyone. So, uh, and again, please reach out to FOSS for Canon Design if you have any questions. Um, uh, just a couple of closing comments. Uh, there's a deadline for submitting uh, presentations for next year's annual conference, which is gonna be May 21st to the 24th in San Diego. So uh, the deadline for that is this Friday, the 11th. So please, uh, you can get that uh, form for, presentations online and uh, we welcome all presentations so we can get there. Um, the next corporate spotlight is gonna be November 16th at one o'clock Eastern. So uh, please register for that online as well. And um, that spotlight is gonna be by the Facilities Engineers Associates and Imaginet Technologies. Um, as well as November 17th at one o'clock Eastern is gonna be a NASFA chat. Uh, this session is, the topic is gonna be a women's collective. This will be a virtual conversation supporting women in facilities management. And we shed light on what was considered once an unconventional career path. Um, so please register for both these online and join the discussion, so, okay. Um, Again, this uh, presentation will be, the recording of this will be on the NASPA website. And again, thank you for everyone. And we look forward to he hearing and seeing you all again sometime. Thank you.